Thank you everyone. I can see people are joining in. It's great to see the names and uh, some of the faces. Um, it's incredible that we are almost into the 2022 and Christmas is just around the corner. And um, here I am welcoming everyone and uh, wishing everyone Happy holidays at the same time. I'm just waiting for a few minutes till uh, we will see Bobby joining us and I will start my conversation with him. Thank you. You can see familiar faces, familiar names, I should say. Just give it another few seconds and I'm sure he will join us. He's usual, as usual, he's on a go and on a trip and uh, doing his many adventures. I think uh, since Bob is uh, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, I think, so hopefully he's going to connect with us just in a few seconds. some people requesting for me to add them to my video but I'm really sorry tonight is a night for Bobby Chin so I won't be able to add anybody else except Bobby so my apology We are starting a bit earlier today. Uh, usually I do my IGTV episodes at 8 p.m. Singapore time. It's an hour earlier, so um, I hope I'm not uh, um, imposing on anybody's dinner plans, but we will have a conversation about dinner, some of it, and about food, of course. So I'm just, uh, I'm just looking for Bobby to join us. Meanwhile, I just, even though I will tell you a little bit um, about some of you who have not uh, been with me for all these times, tonight is my episode number 31. It might be my last episode for this year, but you never know. Sometimes I have unexpected plans to um, do another interesting conversation but as of now I'm planning to start again next year um, this program that I've started uh, uh, conversations with Olga um, it's actually almost a little bit over a year old and uh, it's my one of my COVID projects I should say um, that is really very uh, just something that I truly enjoy and gives me a boost of energy because I connect to all my dear friends, to people whom I've met throughout my career, through my lifespan, and uh, it's amazing to be able to find this platform where I can discuss with them so many interesting things and to offer this opportunity for you guys to join and to listen and um, to join in the conversation. Let me see if I can send him a very quick message. <coughs> if it will go while I'm talking to you guys. So meanwhile, while 
I'm waiting for Bobby. I just want to share with you another one of my uh, passion and COVID projects. I just launched a new book called Little Black Book that um, just came to life uh, just a few days ago. It's in collaboration with my wonderful, extremely kind friends from Bind Artisan. And uh, the book is called, it's here actually, let's show it to you. This is here you go, it's a little black book. And it's sold at Bind Artisan. It's also going to be sold at Kinokuni in a few days time and in Amazon. So if any one of you who are overseas, who are in US and UK, um, you're able to order it from Bind Artisan, by the way, who ship internationally. And for more convenience, uh, um, that um, that um, on Amazon. Let me just uh, hang on just one second because Bobby is writing that he doesn't see me live. Um, let me just reply to him on my WhatsApp. I'm on your page. Okay, let me just try again. sorry for a little bit of a delay but uh, believe me it's all going to be worth it let me just see whether he's somewhere there you know he's asking me to hold on we are in touch on whatsapp so he's there he's ready and it's just probably a bit of a technical issue he's going to join us in a second and i can see more and more people joining so it's a good thing and um just give me one minute one, less than one minute I'm waving to everyone and thank you again for your patience and I'm sure Bobby will, when he will join us, he will profusely apologize. If not, I will apolo I'm apologizing on his behalf. Disconnect for a second if you are okay. I will wait for maybe a few more seconds and I will see whether he can connect to us. Oh, here you go. He's coming. He's, he's coming. He's going. He's just joining in. Hello. How are you? How are you? I'm good. Sorry, I was having difficulties uh, somehow. Yes, that's well, I, I said that when Bobby will come online, he will profusely apologize. If he doesn't apologize, I'm apologizing on his behalf. Am I correct to say that? I'm apologizing. I was trying. Good. Sorry, oops. Yeah, how are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. Bobby, uh, your light is a little bit, I think it's because, uh, is there anything you can do to lift yourself up a little bit more? But make sure that. I'll do that too. Wow. I, meanwhile, oh, that's great. Meanwhile, we're having the tour of your amazing villa wherever you are. Huh? Is it on purpose? No, I, I was sitting outside. I set it up out here because I was going to have the sunset. Oh, actually, I'm much darker now. Oh, the light has. Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, see, this out, is perfect. So this okay. is good. So, yes, this, this angle is good. So, yeah. No, I'm dark. I think I'll be over here. It's yeah, exactly. I'm there sorry we that we will not be able to absorb the sun, sunset, but we trust you. We want to see your face. That's beautiful. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to see you. Um, I will start a little bit just uh, 
to say a few words about my conversations with Olga GTV. I will also say uh, a few words, a shortened version of your bio, uh, because I'm sure you're going to elaborate on it, and I'll make sure that you elaborate on it. So uh, here we go. Welcome, everyone, to Conversations with Olga. It's uh, IGTV YouTube series that I've started a little bit over a year ago. As I mentioned before, it is kind of my COVID project uh, because I've started it during the circuit breakup and I've decided to uh, connect to my friends, to people and personalities who I met through my uh, career, through my uh, life as well, and uh, to introduce uh, all of them to the multicultural Singaporean and global community through a platform that I knew how to manage a little bit because I'm not a techie. So that's why uh, I've learned how to do the IGTV and I've learned how to put it on on a YouTube, but here we are. So tonight is episode number 31 and uh, um, my main mission for these conversations in general is to is in hope to uh, inspire and cultivate a more diverse and more inclusive community. So today uh, I'm very happy to welcome my friend for many, many years, uh, Bobby Chin. And I will say a few words uh, about you, as I said, Bobby, and then we move on from there. Okay. 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 And I will read your bio because there is uh, so many things to mention that I don't want to forget. Some of you may already recognize Bobby. He's an instantly recognizable as a media personality, celebrity chef, and host of the hugely successful World Cafe franchise. He is now a permanent fixture of uh, Top Chef Middle East and host Keep It Simple, which launched in 2020. On his journey, he became an internationally acclaimed chef, author, and restaurateur. Bob has established himself as a mainstay of the global food channel networks, and he's recognized as an expert on Asian and Middle Eastern cuisine. He regularly features as a guest chef on the world's favorite cooking shows and has collaborated with such amazing personalities as Keith Floyd, Martha Stewart, Anthony Bourdain, Anthony Worrell Thompson, and Andrew Zimmer. Bobby graduated uh, Richmond University, London, with a BA in Business Administration and Economics, and was later awarded an honorary PhD in Liberal Arts for his contribution to vocational skill development and his cross-cultural endeavors. He is fluent in English and Arabic, and is an accomplished stand-up comedian, I want you to prove that for, for us tonight, please, musician and performer. Here we go. Having worked at everything from selling kites to hustling on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, this I kind of relate to myself a little bit because so many things that kind of right. I've done from up and all the way across the spectrum. Bobby, you followed your true passion to San Francisco, where you had the privileged opportunity to learn from Hubert Keller, Erica Gilmore, and other culinary greats. With awards for best bar, best rest restaurant, and best lounge, as well as the highly coveted Five Diamonds Award, Bobby garnered international acclaim as both as a chef and restaurateur, entertaining the who's and who, and cooking for the rich and famous, including the Clintons and Bob Dylan. I'm sure there are so many more whom you maybe I'm not, not even able to mention. <laughs> so, uh, Bobby, uh, your life is extremely colorful. And to be honest with you, when I was actually debating with myself, what part of it shall I start with? And while I'm talking to you, because you've been wearing so many different hats in your life. and uh, But then I came across... Uh, your quote, which, where you said, I accidentally become a chef, but I was born a traveler. You are certainly a nomadic person, and you have, all, you have traveled extensively, and you're still on the go right now, as mm. I can see. Uh, have you counted the number of the countries that you visited? I have, but or I always then? keep on forgetting. I keep on forgetting. Well, uh, but yeah, I've traveled a little bit uh, more than, well, obviously more than most. I'm considered uh, an immigration when they go through my passport, a PT, which is a, a perpetual traveler. Um, <laughs> I, I tell them I'm nomadic, you know, so it's one of those things. Yes. But I ought to say something because you see a lot of people that I see, a lot of people my, that follow me are on this and I wanted to introduce you, who you are because oh, I don't do you. this often. Okay, oh. so I got to explain that um, 
if you ever go to Olga, if you ever go to Singapore, and you ever get invited to a really cool party, like a classy party, like a party that kind of like a table or something like someone's getting married, and like who the hell did this, is probably Olga. Because <laughs> Olga throws the greatest events ever. And when I was there, I said, who does something like this? And it's not one. You, you do like three or four events a year before this whole COVID thing hit. Just remarkable events. And you, you are one of the great socialites of Singapore. And so I feel honored and privileged to be here with you today. So, anyway. Thank you so much. Well, let me just do the disclaimer. That was not uh, scripted and it was not inten intentional. And But thank you so much for, for your introduction, Bobby. Really kind of you. Thank you. Everyone, so, knows, everyone knows that I'm unscripted. Yes, I know. So am I. So, but thank you so much. So what I wanted to ask you about your heritage, actually, and I always love to talk about the heritage and, and history of the family and the traditions uh, of my friends. Can you share a little bit about your background? Well, I'm half Egyptian, half Chinese. I could actually get into greater fractions, but I don't want to because my, my father is actually three quarters Chinese and a quarter Australian. Um, I was born in New Zealand. Um, I was educated between three continents by the age of 10. I've considered San Francisco my home, but I've not lived there for most of my life. Um, so it was San Francisco, Egypt, and England. And I think that uh, Egypt and England had a colossal influence on me um, as a kid. Because if you, if you grow up as an American, um, you know, I mean, you see the whole Black Lives Matter movement. I was Egyptian Chinese. They didn't have any of those. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, uh, and it was a very uh, a different, um, it, was, it was quite unique to have parents of different uh, backgrounds, um, socially, culturally, uh, economically, as well. Yes. So, um, so I was in, a, in a, weird, uh, a weird thing, but to me, it always looked was normal, because that was my life. So I, so what's weird, you know? It's, it's, it's normal for me. So no, nothing really is that crazy. So yes. uh, yeah, yes. that's, that's, that's my, uh, that's where I was kind of like uh, educated and um, uh, brought up um, from public schools in the United States to private schools, uh, to public English schools, which are private schools in the West. Um, so I had a really weird, uh, you, very uh, eclectic background when it came to my education. Sure. And I'm sure you probably, and especially you probably had the whole variety of the school lunches between U.S. horror food and the U.K. lunches when you were a child. So have you always been a foodie, though? Um, I like to say that I, I, my appreciation for food really came when I was about 10 years old and I went to English boarding school. And it was the first time that I realized that food did not have to be an enjoyable experience because until the age of 10, everything I ate was incredible. And my appreciation yeah. for food started around there. My love of Indian food came around the age of 10 because that was like completely, you know, the spices versus the bland came out of a can type of routine. Yeah. Um, and then um, I had a, a really great Chinese grandmother that cooked incredibly light, clean Chinese flavors. Chinese people yeah. from Hong Kong, Taiwan, anywhere that was a foodie would sit there and say, my God, you know, she's very unique. Why is it light, clean and all that stuff? Um, and my Egyptian grandmother was a diplomat. So, she, you know, I've learned a lot from the two of them. They were yeah. huge influences on me. Yeah. And of course, my parents were both uh, foodies. So I was just brought up in a really kind of foodie environment. And coming from San Francisco. Yes. That's, yeah, yeah, British city. It's another, another, another paradise. So what is your style? Do you, what is your preference for the cuisine? Uh, well, it's probably perhaps maybe a little bit of a wrong question, at least at this point. And do you have a style of cooking? Based well, on all I'm this not, variety of uh, expo uh, exporters and uh, different countries that yeah. you lived in, I, I honestly, I, I, I've, I'm like a work in progress. I like initially, like I usually like to say that women cook out of love and men cook out of ego, and I'm just as guilty as most guys. And we'll always say that our grandmother and our aunts and our mothers influenced us, and yeah. we, we learn from love but we want to do like technically difficult things to show respect from other chefs that, you know, we can do cook up, you know, a squab perfectly in medium rare or to make a sauce or those types of techniques. Um, once you get past that, like you've done it and you've working on it for me um, and then filming those TV shows, 
um, I started to, to, to go more ethnic. Like I wanted to go authentic. Um, and then yeah. um, I've always been, um, like I like feeding animals, so I don't enjoy killing them. Um, so uh, to me, uh, I'm, I'm generally a vegetarian. And, um, and I look at our health, our, our, our food system as being, um, it's, it's not really working. And so all of a sudden that also influenced me tremendously to try and cook something that would be like food is, is medicine and medicine is food um, mm. and cook, cook for your, cook for your health, I think, and yes. make it healthier and make it um, tasty. I mean, that's, the, that's the goal is to make a healthy food taste good. Yeah. That's very yeah. important because yeah. it's not always the case when people go in, when people just don't think about the taste element and just follow the food route. So what was the turning point uh, that you basically uh, really got immersed into the culinary world in your life? Well, I think it was, um, it was, um, I left Wall Street and I, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. I have a BA in finance economics. I worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and I asked myself, what skills do I have? I'm, I'm a haggler. I can have short-term memory. I can do quick mathematical equations, those types of things. And I decided to go see an educational counselor because I didn't have one. And um, she was basically a shrink. She was, she was double listed in the yellow pages. And, <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, um, I, and I was making her laugh throughout the throughout my 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 my, my childhood trauma. She was laughing, and so I. Um, I, I well, I'm laughing too. Out. Just listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I walked out of this out of this thing. Um, I didn't have the heart to tell her that I was I was quitting. I, I, I just, that's how you get out of therapy. You just tell them I'm cured, and they tell you no, 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 no. You get a diagnosis. I'm like no, 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 no. You got you got you got child. You have childhood issues, uh, <laughs> and so I walked out of this uh, my last session. And it was almost like an omen. And I heard this song that I heard a thousand and one times before. And the lyrics go, you can spend all your time making money. You can spend all your love making time. And I was like, okay. yeah. And I was like, wow, I think I understand what that means now. And it wasn't important to know what I wanted. It was, it was important to know what I didn't want. And I didn't exactly. want to wear a suit and tie and fight for money and all that stuff. I needed to find something that I would love doing that I would not consider work. And one of it was making people laugh and telling my stories of what, how I see the world, but find a comic angle for it. And the other was feeding people and, and working with different people every single day. Um, and, you know, working with nature and, and, and creating and all that stuff, just like, wow, I never, I never saw it. And then I thought, wow, I have two great grandparents. Uh, I've, I've eaten at, at phenomenal restaurants. Um, I come from a, a culinary family in a culinary city. I think I'm entitled to be, be able to do this. And that yeah. was the change. And so I asked my parents, I said, you know, I want to be a chef. And my mother says, we don't have chefs in the family. Um, <laughs> we don't, because it's just looked down, it's looked down in, in the Middle East as if you're, you know, you're a cook. I was like, I want to be a chef. And they're like, no, we don't have cook. We don't have cooks in the family. I said, well, I'll give you a choice. I can either be a cook or you can have a clown. Which one do you want, a clown or a chef? And she says, you've lost the plot. You're on your road. And so I, did, I, I took the hard route. And to prove myself, I, I worked really hard. And um, I worked with really great people. And people yes. really, um, chefs are very giving. I mean, they really yeah. are. There's a compassionate side to them. They might get a little whiffy if you mess with their cuisine. But they're generally very, very kind um, because they enjoy feeding people. And it's I wanted true. to be in that environment. It's true. Yeah. I, and that's the, actually talking about that, uh, moving on on the same subject. You've worked with so many incredible people and so many incredibly famous uh, chefs and socialized with them. Who you think uh, uh, gave you the most impact? And I also would like to actually, bad or good, I should say. And also I would like to hear... Uh, do you have some of the anecdotes uh, about uh, these people when you were socializing and doing something together with them? If you can share. There were the, yeah, no, I think they're the people. I'm going to move here because I'm getting eaten by mosquitoes, Olga. Okay, so go. <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to just get out of here. 
Um, yes, anyway, it's getting I dark, and then I, I see the beautiful... Yeah, yeah I'm trying to find the light. Um, I'll tell you what. My, um, I volunteered to work at one of the greatest French restaurants in San Francisco. Let me see if this is light here. Perfect. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hold on. Okay. No? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Mm. How about here? Hold on a second. Over here. This looks like it has light behind me. Uh, is this okay? Yes, but can you? Okay, here. Move. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Don't move. Perfect. Oops. Okay. Don't, don't go lower. Yeah. Okay, great. So my first job in a professional kitchen was with the, one of the greatest chefs in San Francisco by the name of Hubert Keller. And I, um, he, wanted a, he wanted a cook, but I, uh, but I was a waiter. But I was volunteering in this kitchen. And I begged him for the job. I never, uh, I never uh, volunteered to work for anybody for free. It's un-Chinese, I got to tell you. Um, so I, uh, I, I said I would work for free for two weeks. Please, I want to be a chef. Um, I have no bad habits. Um, I want to work for the best. Um, cause I don't, you know, you, you want to learn so, cause you learn the right way. Right? You don't make, you don't learn the wrong way. Yeah. And, um, and he gave me the job and I would go to work every day early. Uh, I'd leave late, but every single day that I went to work, I would visit my grandmother. And it's a kind of a weird thing because, you know, like, you know, grandparents aren't exactly, uh, people you want to hang out with when you're in your twenties. Well, it depends. When they, your grandparents are cool and progressive and adore you, you, you gravitate to them. So I guess your grandmother yeah. was that kind. Yeah, no, well, uh, no, I think the age difference was much greater. I think that it was like, it was harder to communicate, you know, as a kid. I did that with my mm. Egyptian grandmother, very easy, because she was only like, you know, 40 years older than me. My Chinese grandmother, um, she was like, you know, 56 years older than me. Uh, so it was, it was, it was hard. It was, it was, it, it, it was like, you know, you'd ask Nana, how's the weather? Uh, what'd you do today? Uh, you run out of, you run out of things. This was a more yes. natural organic thing that I can talk to my grandmother for the first time in a way that was just, it was, it was like, I don't know. It was, little, it, it was, it was like all those years you felt guilty for not having these conversations. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And yes. she would tell me, she would, she would, she would, she would encourage me. And she would tell me that, you know, when I had a really, cause that was a bad day every day. I was, I, I, yeah, I would not, I can't lie to you. I struggled. It was hard. And I wanted to quit every day. And she'd say, no, you know, it takes time. And, um, but you have the passion and you have the attitude, but yeah. you know, don't, you know, don't give up. And that was the, that was all of a sudden, yes. the conversation I never had with my grandmother before. And I think that built it. So I think yes. Eric Keller was colossal for me. Um, and then, you know, all the chefs that cooks, guys below me, guys above me, I learned from everybody. It's not like it's exclusive to the guy that wears the white jacket. I mean, I've learned yes. a lot from the people wearing pajamas on the streets of Vietnam, you know, yes. cooking one dish for three generations. Yes, got it. Well, because, you know, to be, I mean, and I love chefs and I have many um, wonderful friends who are chefs, but sometimes chefs could be arrogant. No, yeah. so if they, if they let you learn at the, the end of year, they kind of um, accept you in their tribe. I think it's it's wonderful, and yeah. obviously that's what happened with you. That's great. Uh, and you, um, your restaurants. How many restaurants have you opened? Oh, I, fr I lost track of how many I opened. How many okay. do I own? I got none. <laughs> well, okay. Well, that's um, that. that, that Go ahead, because I will ask you actually another question that I want to know. To be um, in this business, do you also, to be in the restaurant business, I should say, do you also need to have a very, very sharp business sense and manage the business from the financial point of view and whether you were able to do that as well? Yeah, I think that um, I, my, my, it's the highest failing business in the world because all you need is money, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you want to be a doctor, you got to go to four years. You know, you want to be a lawyer, four years. You want to be a restaurateur, uh, you know, go right ahead. All you got to do is pay the piper. Um, 
I found that in every job I worked in, I found that there was, uh, there was a way to steal. And they would tell you that you do it this way because someone's going to steal. And this is like, this is how they train, you know, a lot of places are trained to tell me like this. And yeah. I don't think you enter as a thief, but you definitely can lead as one. And mm -hmm. I think what happens is, is that um, you need that, that on-job training to learn how every which way to steal so that when you become, because you're the mouse, and then one day they, they say, hey, hey, you're good. We'll make you the cat. So the cat knows every single way to manage, to prevent this stuff from happening. So it's learning how to do that, learning how to do it the right way, learning yeah. the systems. And that's yeah. osmosis. I mean, you can go read it in a book, but until you're waiting a table and you got three tables and yes. you all these things going on, you have to know exactly what to do, when to do it. And, and every night is not exactly the same, right? There's always something different. In of it. course. And I think that that's the experience. So I think that, um, that I learned that way. Um, and for fear of failure, I did things in a way that was unheard of, you know, I, I, uh, managing, like, you know, I, I look at the numbers, I can look at numbers and dissect numbers because I worked on Wall Street, and I have a BA in finance and economics, and you got to understand the numbers. Um, but you know, like, if someone delivers you a fish in the middle of service, and they stiff, they, they, they fill it with ice, and you're paying ice, and you don't get the yield, you know, something's wrong, you don't know what, until you start having those times. So Absolutely. You know, the light bulbs, light bulbs, I used to, I used to take my light bulbs, put my signature on it, and then write the date that I'm putting it in. So when someone says you put your light bulbs out, I'm like, well, show, give me the light bulb back. And then I know. That must be the that... schools in the US and the UK that taught you that trick. Label everything what belongs to you. Yeah, label, yeah, yeah, labeling yeah. Was, was kind of important. That belongs to me. Uh, yeah, there's, there's so many different aspects of it that I, um, that I, 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 I lived it and I enjoyed it but I enjoyed entertaining. I enjoyed having people coming. Like, as you know, when you're throwing a party, yes. people come and they say, Olga, thank you. Right. But this of is course. wonderful. You know, they look yes. around and they marvel at your work and that is your art. It's going to be gone tomorrow, but it's an experience today that will that, be remembered for a long exactly. time. Exactly. You are so right. I totally can relate to it. It's, uh, it's something that we create that will stay in people's minds. And, uh, yeah. and that I think it's just like uh, me that what drives you, you want to, uh, you want to please, you want to please people. Am I yeah. correct? To say that? Yeah. In order to please you, you perfect yourself more and more because you want to hear the praises. You want to see the happiness in people's uh, uh, faces and uh, people to come back to you and to, rem to remind you about something that you've done years ago. I feel the same way all the time. And that's actually a driving force for me to continue and to, to do even better. So I'm glad that you're sharing that. And now you're learning. I know that, well, you're always learning and I know that. And now you're very interested in developing a holistic approach. If I'm correct, that's what the, yeah. we spoke about a little bit. And that's what I saw in casual dining, right? With a focus of, on individual and collective well-being. Can you please share with us a little bit about this concept that you are so passionate about these days? Well, I, I, um, I, I know that, there's, that, that food is poison today. I mean, seven of the leading, 10 leading causes of death are diet related. And I took a course uh, at Cornell University with uh, Dr. Colin Campbell, and I was learning a lot about, um, about diet, nutrition, and, and, and how you know, certain industries like the livestock industry came about and the byproducts of them. Mm. Um, and uh, and I've, I've kind of like been on and off vegetarian since the age of 15. Um, and people say, well, how can you be a chef? I go, I can eat it, I can cook it, but I don't really want to. Uh, I don't want it for, for myself. I, I don't, and I'll do it for you, right? But, um, and so when I went to Vietnam, I found a cuisine that was modern, but perfected thousands of years ago. It's gluten-free, yeah. it's low fat, it's healthy, it's tasty. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And I felt that, you know, I started looking at a lot of food like that. You know, when I was doing my TV shows, as an example, I would gain anywhere between two to two and a half kilos in three days. Wow. Now, oh yeah, wow. I mean, and it'd take me like a month to take it off, two months to take it no off. No wonder sometimes uh, I was not able to recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So, uh, so there's that. Um, and, and, and that, and that's how it begins. It starts, it starts with what do I want? You know, uh, I want to learn this. And, and, and then I just engulf myself in the internet allows you to do all the research. You can decipher who's real, who's not. Yeah. And, and you learn and it's all free. You know, you can go learn anything for free now. Absolutely. It's remarkable. It's incredible. It is. I took a number of courses in Yale University and Harvard uh, absolutely for free during the COVID time. And it's, it's, it's incredible. I just definitely... What did you study? People, in general? Yeah. I, went to, I, went to, I, I have an MBA from NYU in uh -huh. New York. Yes. Yeah, but healthcare they, they finance. Sorry? Healthcare oh. finance. Yes, healthcare finance. Because uh, just like uh, you... My parents, I come from medical families, so everybody assumed that I have to be a doctor. So I went for pre-med, and I really could not see myself being a doctor, so I switched into the uh, uh, MBA program, but in healthcare finance to please basically my family. So, but it's also kind of never really, <laughs> never really uh -huh. gravitated into the, the career of, of profession, but yes, so I come but from But you apply medical. it. Sorry, I, if I apply it. You, you apply it. Well, if we, I guess whatever we learn in life, it doesn't matter where we study and what we study, we tend to apply one way or another. So yes, yes, I, I guess yeah. in, in a sense I am. Uh, but you know, talking about Vietnamese food you mentioned, this is actually, I love Vietnamese food. The flavors, the, 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 um, uh, the variety, the way it's presented, the senses, uh, really, it's, and it's very clean cuisine. And uh, you even said, you know, you described Vietnamese food as being as near to nirvana as imaginable. And uh, that's, I, I just want you to continue on this a little bit. And what uh, drew you to Vietnamese food in the first place? Is it what you just mentioned, that it's a clearness of it and the health associated well, with the taste buds as well? Yeah, what happened was I was working as a waiter. My father says, uh, what are you, a stand-up comic waiter? Uh, number one, you're not funny. Two, you're a crappy waiter. Three, your education's far too expensive to think that you're a funny waiter. Vietnam's the future. And he starts going over the financial and the fundamentals of why Vietnam will not be another baby tiger, but the tail of the dragon with China being its head. And he goes on and on. I like to call my dad Field Gold Frankie because then he gets really excited. Both his hands will come up like this. It's great. You got to come and see it. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And so... Uh, I asked him, well, how about the food? And no one could describe the food. So I went to a bookstore and I couldn't find a Vietnamese cookbook written by a Vietnamese person. It was written by French people. It was like two. I went to several bookstores. There's nothing out there. And I realized that because of the US embargo, people didn't know anything about Vietnam. So I went to Vietnam yeah. and I saw these people making foods that I could not imagine. That flavors, uh, just the broth. I was like, why is a chicken chicken noodle soup tastes like this. It's so good. Everyone loves chicken noodle soup globally. And so um, I figured that I would go to Vietnam, learn the cuisine, and then go back to San Francisco and open a high-end French Vietnamese restaurant. That was the, kind of like the plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I fell in love with the country. Um, I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the lifestyle. My friends were all expats running NGOs or corporations or yeah. struggling. Whoever we were, we were different because we were there. Um, and I learned from the, the people on the streets. They taught me. Uh, they just sort of, you just, they didn't really want to teach me. I just would show up at one, two, three, four, five, six in the afternoon. Actually, I saw it in some of your programs. This is exactly how you act. You just show up and you just kind of take their yeah. space. Yeah, I came here. I came here. I said, look at, you know, like any uh, the general manager, I guess, knew me. And he's like, anything we could do for you? I said, actually, yeah, um, I'd like to learn how to make a masamon curry. I said, well, oh, first okay. of all, you should you should please tell us all where you because uh, not everybody knows where you now. I I'm in the PP Islands. Here you uh, go. In Lucky Sakai you. Hotel. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Yes. Um, and I, I'm in a, a nice villa and I'm just taking it easy because I want to get to Vietnam to see my dad, um, but I okay. got to get the paperwork because you have to get, Edgar is an expert, so that's not easy. Um, and so uh, the general manager says, anything we can do for you? I'm like, I'd like to learn how to make a masamon curry. So today 
they literally pulled out and it was like doing a cooking show. They're like, and there's our fisherman comes at this time and I wanted to yeah. show you that we have this. And I was like, that's great. So um, that's how I learned. I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to be a chef because once you become a chef, people don't, you're supposed to be the teacher. I don't mind sharing and teaching, but I still want to learn. And so yeah. I still learn from, as I say earlier, that, you know, people in pajamas to the people on sidewalks to whatever, you know, it could be anybody. You know, yeah. if someone says to me, my mom makes this really well. I will go in. I said, you want a prep cook? Because, I, you know, I don't mind helping. Yes. Food brings people together. I'm, I'm, I'm in a profession absolutely. that I really love. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, talking, you know, and you, I can hear your passion about Vietnam, especially. And uh, you wore, as I mentioned before, so many different, you are wearing so many different hats in your life. And one of it is being a writer. And your book about Vietnam, I think it's Wild Wild East, right? Recipes and yeah. stories from Vietnam. And I think you published it in 2007, if I'm mistaken. So, and, That's uh, right. and it's won the, uh, is that the book that won the best Asian cookbook? It was, it was nominated. It didn't win. Nominated. It, it was, it was yeah, yeah, it was nominated. Um, it was also censored and it was also banned. So I feel like really? an existential writer. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, why, well, why is that? Why was it uh, uh, banned? What did you write about? Well, there's some stories. I understand that you incorporate your travels there as well, in, in, not only the recipes. I was, well, I mean, like, I went to Vietnam and I had no idea how anything worked. It was like, um, it was like um, Rick from Casablanca, when they asked him, hey, Rick, why did you come to Casablanca? He said, I came for the waters. He says, there are no waters. He said, I was misinformed, right? I felt the same way. And so I was learning literally like, what does that guy do? What's that sound? What's he calling for? He's walking around with a bicycle with nothing. He says, that guy will refill your Bic lighter. That's how poor Vietnam was. And they threw nothing. There was no garbage, you know? So I was like, um, I just loved everything. I was young. Um, I, I, I was afraid of failure. I think, um, well, I think I already failed because I got a BA in finance economics. And I wasn't happy. And I worked on a job and I had these great jobs and I failed because I didn't want to be there. Now all of a sudden I want to be a chef. Well, what happens if I fail, right? I mean, cause I'm bound to fail. And so I figured I go to Vietnam, I'll learn the cuisine, I'll be a chef. And if I fail, nobody knows me. I had no idea what was going to happen. And so, well, the stories in that book were the stories that I would tell through a dining room. And I would, yeah. you know, people ask your day and I just repeat certain stories. And by the time I had to write that book, it was already a script in my head, you know? So I was sharing these stories, sharing what I learned. And um, there was, uh, you know, like, you know, people don't want to hear about dog, dog meat. And I was like, but yeah, but it exists. And why don't I write about it? Um, or the horrors of war, which are also in that book, yeah. you know, which people didn't appreciate um, in the government. But funnily enough, uh, uh, seven years later, they'd make me the ambassador of tourism, which is, you know, for, for the EU. Oh. So, because I, I would tell the story, because I am passed, I didn't do it out of disrespect. I did it to let people know this is, yes, this is what it is. Of course. And this is, I guess, like all your projects, to be honest with you, from what I absorbed and what I know about you, they express your personality. So I think the way you probably written this book through your adventurous eye and through the experiences that you lived through, this is how you are. Am I correct to say who you are? What is your personality? What is your style, Bobby? What is yeah, your style? I don't know. I haven't found a shrink that has figured that out yet. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I, 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 I think that, you know, I always get asked a question, what's your favorite dish to cook? What's your favorite cuisine? What's your, fa what's your favorite color? What's your favorite number? I, I never had that. I never had that. I never had like, where's I'll make head? sure that I will not ask you this questions, okay? Promise. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> no, I get, I get asked like, where, where's home? And I was like, well, what is home? I mean, to yeah. you or to someone that has, a, I don't have a house. So what could home be? For years it was Vietnam, right? I lived there for 22 years. Yes, um, yes. But now all of a sudden it's like, I don't know, for the last eight years, I've been nomadic. 
home has always been wherever I am because I make home, like when I come to Singapore, I feel somewhat at home. I know people, I, you know, I stay at a means place. I got friends there. Yeah. Um, yes. If I stay at a hotel, I know all the, all the waiters and the, and the staff and the management. And it's just like, I don't feel like a stranger in your town. I don't feel yes. like a stranger in Thailand, Vietnam, San Francisco, New York, London, Cairo. Um, yeah. Those would be kind of like my homes. And I make my home wherever I am. I go to Saudi Arabia and I make that home when I'm filming. You know, yes. it's like I go in and I put everything out of my bag. And I stick it in the closet. I'm not going to be here for a while. So I'm going to get yes. used to it. That's fantastic. And, you know, you are known as a comedian. So you think the sense of humor really helps you in these adventures and in this journey through, that you've been doing for all so many years. And I've observed you in some of the episodes that I've watched. And uh, even now, the way you present yourself, you are very sharp. You are funny. Uh, and you're a bit sarc sarcastic at times. You are very natural. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, if I am to start to list all your appearances and TV engagements, I probably would run out of time very, you know, very quick and we would need to do another session. So uh, I would like at this point just to list a few of your appearances and, if, and mention a few. And I will need to read them because I could not remember every single one. So if you don't mind, I will just share with our listeners where you've appeared and what you've done as a TV personality or as a Bobby in showbiz. Okay, so uh, you have established yourself as mainstay in the global food channel networks, including Discovery TLC, NBC, Globe Tracker, Food Network, CNN, BBC, Channel 4 UK, and UK TV, in addition to World Cup. You solo hosted Bobby Chin Cooks Asia, Detox and Restaurant Bobby Chin for which you were nominated the best reality show executive producer. Wow. And as I mentioned previously, you have worked alongside with some of the world's leading TV food personalities, including Keith Floyd, Martha Stewart, Anthony Bourdain, uh, Anthony Warhol Thompson, and Andrew Zimmern. Who are you think the most divas out of them all? Divas? Yes. Probably Andrew Warhol Thompson. Why? Because <laughs> um, I think that he was in his in his own little world. Um, I don't like. I, 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 it's hard for me to compare, but I mean, if I compare with Bourdain, Bourdain, Bourdain really wanted to learn. You know, Bourdain was coming out, and and he was like, "How the hell did you do this? How did you? I mean, how did you? How did you become an expat? Um, you know." Um, how do you, and then we had a whole, whole discussion on travel and there was a kind of a, a more of a, of an exchange. Um, and I felt the same with Keith Floyd. Keith Floyd was like, and I said, I walked up to Keith, I said, Keith, yeah. you know, you've been a colossal influence on me and I really love, I love your work. And we just bonded. Um, um, everyone that came that knew me, met me through Vietnam, knew that I had done something. I don't think Andrew yeah. Will Thompson saw that. Um, it was Anthony was in his English uh, BBC audience, and I was not part. I was just a guest, yeah. you know. And I worked with him in, yes. in Brunei. Um, and you know, when you compare the productions, like if, when we film our TV shows with with, with Discovery or, or with uh, Pilot Productions, I mean, you know, I would set my own table. You know, I would I would sit down with the director. A lot of us sit up. I'd be I'd be I'd be setting up the table while I'm explaining him how we're going to cook yes. the dish and why we should why we're going to cook it this way, what I was going to talk about, and things that I think are interesting about the dish. Because the, the director is not necessarily a chef. The director is, is, a, is, a, is a TV, uh, the eye of the audience. And yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to show them that I have the same eyes. I'm sharing you what I've learned through the thing. Um, and I would have to do a lot of work. When I worked with Anthony Will Thompson, he didn't have to do any of that stuff. I was like, wow, you know, we got a coffee break. I mean, they start at 11 in the afternoon. I mean, we'd get it like five in the morning, you know, it takes them like, it would take them like two weeks to film an hour show, which we would do in wow. five days. If that gives you any idea. Well, that's so, a diva. That's a diva yeah. for sure. I, I subscribe to this. Yes. Yes. I, I can see that. Well, thank you for sharing. It's a, it's a quite a cool anecdote, I should say. Um, Bobby, uh, with all your larger than life personality you're also a very very um kind person and you're involved in many of the philanthropic projects and i will mention a few 
and you just now actually been, uh, uh, I think, um, named a goodwill ambassador for the Naomi Tanya Memorial Fund, which supports women and young uh, people in Cambodia to study the culinary art, if I'm correct to say. You just told me this a few days ago, but before that, you supported vocational training programs aimed to improve the future pro uh, future prospects of dis especially disadvantaged children, I think, through Vietnam's Blue Dragon Children's Foundation and have served at the WWF Ambassador for Sustainable Seafood and Coral Triangle Awareness. So can you please uh, tell me how important it is to promote ethically sourced and environmentally sustainable produce and that what draws you to, to be involved in this uh, philanthropic uh, activities? I think I cook out of love, uh, first and foremost, and I would cook and serve anything that I would serve to my mother. And that's my standard. And so I try to get everyone to cook like you're cooking for your mother, because everybody yeah. wants to, to, to appease the, the, that who gave yeah. you life and gave you all that you have. Um, and generally that is, can be somewhat more expensive. Um, uh, it can be organic, organic is generally more expensive but didn't really bother me. Yeah. Um, and that's how it started in Vietnam. And um, I dive. And so as a diver, um, I saw what happens to people's coral reefs. And so I would not serve um, a, a, a swordfish for years. I, I still yeah. have so for 20, 30 years, I've never served a swordfish. And so, um, and because I was in Hanoi, I was learning a lot from a lot of the non-government organizations that were teaching me things, even from you know, human trafficking. Um, and so uh, there's the food part, and then my guests were my teachers. And um, I, had, I had taken a young boy from the streets, who was a shoeshine boy, and, um, and this kid never worked inside of a building before. And his English was pretty good because he's been trying shoes in Hanoi for yeah. several years. Yes. And everyone that came and says, that kid's a good kid. And it reminded me of my first job interview when I went to Uber Keller. And he says, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I was looking for a cook. And I looked, I said, this is my opportunity to give back. And I told that little, I told this kid that I would make him a manager one day if he trusted me and he believed in me. And he ended up doing that. And um, word got out that I had taken... Uh, a street kid. Um, and then that's how I met uh, uh, Michael Browski from Blue Dragon. And he says, I got kids. And then I started taking kids. And some of the street kids weren't criminals, they're gangsters. You know, not all of them are going to sit there and listen, they're going to rob you, you know, but, yeah. but I made that effort. And then I started learning about human trafficking. And uh, the problem with that, um, um, and, and the most vulnerable are the young girls. And so that's where I was like, okay, let's, let's do women. Let's, let's take on, let's, let's empower women. Actually, it happened in Singapore with uh, John Wood from um, Room to Read. And I was doing an event for him. Yes, and yes. Raised, I was in the uh, Four Seasons and he took me out for coffee to thank me afterwards. And I asked, I asked people, what's the secret to your success? And he said, empower women, teach women. Women will teach the next generation. And so... I was doing that already, but that just enforced it. And then the one we did the next program for Blue Dragon was like, let's, let's, let's take in these, these girls, let's make them successful. So about a year ago, I asked Michael, I was like, Michael, you know, you gotta get validated these days. You mind like writing a validation for me on my LinkedIn, you know? And he says, sure. Um, he says, I wanna let you know that the young boy that you hired is the most successful restaurateur from his village and his restaurant is packed all the time. And I was like, that's my dividend. I didn't necessarily, I'm not taking anything with me, but I know that that kid will remember that I made that effort for him and for the others that, 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 that walked through my doors. This is an incredible story. And I, I have goosebumps. Thank you for sharing yeah. it. And it's really extremely inspiring, really. Uh, thank you once again. And that, I wanted to ask you about the difference in quality uh, do you think that the regular consumer feels the difference in quality of food when, it's, when the ingredients are sourced ethically? Yes, it depends on the level. Um, there's a chef in New York by the name of Dan Barber. Um, he has a restaurant called Blue Hill Farm. And you go there 
and you know, go to nice restaurants and sometimes the waiters are snotty. You know, they give you attitude, like, you know, <laughs> they have to explain it to me. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Um, yeah. here it's like an education. And the first thing he does is he has uh, baby vegetables hanging and you taste these vegetables and you're like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. The same with any of the animal pro protein, everything about his place, he's uncompromising. He's setting yeah. a standard and any chef that's a chef should know about him if they don't. And any chef that does know him will sit there and speak volumes of what he's yeah. doing because he's that great. And I think that, um, that um, traveling and filming the World Cafe shows, when I would see baby sharks, I was like, you know, with their fins cut off, I was yes. like, oh my God, you know, words got out uh, that, you know, I was like, it has no flavor. It, it's meaningless. I mean, it's yes. just a, it's it's just an old stupid idea that was limited just for the for the for the emperor of China, you yes. know. And now every Chinese person wants to eat it, and you're like, no, 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 you got the wrong got the wrong story. There's another story to that. Yes, it's very true, absolutely. And Bobby, um, fast food. How does the you know sometimes we talk about fast fashion. Uh, can fast food be um, sort of healthy and uh, uh, environmentally friendly and uh, sustainable at the same time? Because sometimes fast food is really associated with something really unhealthy and sort of um, not very, uh, uh, yeah. not, not, not really something that we would offer anywhere. Can you try to change the mind. Would you be able, I should say, try the mindset about the fast food one day or sometime? I think, it's, I think it's already happening. I think that like um, a company like Chipotle, as an example, was trying to basically grow and breed uh, their, their, uh, their pork and source yes. responsibly. It's a, and we need people like that and people yes. like that exist, especially this younger generation. This younger generation are the ones that when we were kids, we wanted to change the world. I think the young kids today are the most progressive, the most open-minded, um, and, and they have, they're seeing what we've been seeing and we weren't able to do it. And I'm thinking that this is gonna change. I think that there's a guy by the name of Paul Stamets, uh, who's a leading mycologist who's educated. There's a great documentary on Netflix called uh, Fantastic Fungi. Um, yes, yes, it's a great documentary. I've seen it. Yeah, six ways in which mushrooms can save the world. Yes, and I think yes. that we could be eating a lot more plant-based yes. um, uh, uh, product. Um, I'm not looking for, uh, you know, a, a a product that looks like meat, tastes like meat, bleeds like yeah. meat, but it's not meat, and it's, yes. I don't know what's in it. I want whole, I agree, plant-based product, and I think that we should be working towards that because the third. The third rail on, on climate change, on greenhouse gases, is agriculture. So we have to really change our food system. And I think that Singapore, interestingly enough, is very, was very uh, uh, quick. At very progressive. Oops, something happened. Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, OK. Can you, you hear just, me now? I can hear you now, yes. Thank you. Can, can you please repeat what you said just now? Yeah, the majority of the food in Singapore, 90% of it was being imported. So the government came up with the 30 by 30 program to basically create 30% of the food being, being grown or created in Singapore and also creating a, uh, a agricultural tech hub for food mm -hmm. uh, because they recognize that this is going to be a major problem. Climate yes. change is a problem. Food yeah. is a major part of that problem. It's part of our healthcare system. It's the cause of this virus, supposedly. Those that are dying... <laughs> are obese and they're not healthy. So, yes. um, so you know, food is important. I think that we can make healthy food, healthy fast food. And that's one of the things I like about Vietnamese food because Vietnamese food is somewhat fast. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, I totally really, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And Thank you. before we end our session today, I would like to ask just very quickly a few of the just very simple, very personal, I should say, personal questions. You know, uh, one of my favorite movies is Babette's Feast. I love that movie. And I'm sure, Babette's Feast? You I haven't, haven't seen Babette's Feast? No, I haven't seen that. 
I can't remember. Oh, it's an amazing movie, and I think you'll love it. It's this uh, uh, woman who's, who cooks the incredible feast for, for, the, for, for the group of people. I don't want to tell you more because I think you'll enjoy watching this movie oh. in general. If you are to ask to, to prepare uh, an amazing feast, whom would you like to cook it for? Whom would you like to do it? Um, I don't know. I think friends, family. Um, okay. I enjoy cooking. I don't mind. I, I, I you know, you want to cook, like, you know, cooking for famous people, it gives you kind of like, oh, you cook for the Clintons or you cooked for, you know, Dylan or uh, Cindy, Craw not Cindy Crawford. Um, I forgot her name. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, I've cooked for famous people. What you really want to cook for is people that really appreciate your food or are foodies. And they say to you, I've eaten all over the world and honey, that was a great meal. That appeals to me. Cooking for family and bringing family together and friends together is always kind of like that, that, that variable that I never thought of that when all of a sudden I bring people together through food and, when it's, and, and, and they appreciate it and they're happy yes. to be there. Absolutely. Is, is priceless. Well, you really, I, I agree. And you really have to promise me that when you come to Singapore, you have to cook for me as one of your friends and for all our mutual friends together. We're all waiting for you here. Of course. And we'll offer you all the and multiple makes me do it all the time. Yes. Well, you know, he's yeah. my neighbor, by the way. No, I know. So, I know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he always yeah. says, you've never cooked. I have. I've cooked for him several times. Many, not many times, but several times. Uh, yes. So we are chance. waiting for you here. And uh, it would be Bobby, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and if it would be your last meal, what would it be, you personally? It would be a buffet. Buffet? Yeah. Like, like against buffet. gluten it'll, Everything. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be like a little bite here, a little bite there. Oh there might God. need to That's... be a vomitorium as well. Maybe a vomitorium as well. It's like, hold on, hold on. We're not finished here yet. I'm oh, a, my God. Yeah, that, I would I'm never expect this answer. Pictures. Sorry? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I can't choose that one thing. Okay. I recognize in a buffet, it's got everything. Yes, very true. I just never expected this kind of answer. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's very clever. Good point. Thank you for, for answering this. And, uh, um, and last question, what's in your personality uh, or your character's misconception to your friends or to anybody who knows you? You know, I don't have a problem with uh, misconceptions by others. Um, it's my friends that I'm more concerned about. And so like a lot of people say things about me that aren't true. Um, and my friends will say, my God, you hear this? And I was like, uh, I don't care. Cause it's coming from Brazil, it doesn't know me. So um, I'm not really concerned of what others um, uh, uh, think. I think that I'm a decent human being. Um, I don't, I mean like my goals when I wake up in the morning is, uh, I make people laugh and smile and I'm nice. And I, I try to get 20 people to laugh a day. That's kind of like my, my currency. Um, okay. and I, well, I'm, I'm in about... your account for today, okay? You made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's how it works, you know? And, 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 that's, um, and that is my connection. I can find a thousand, a thousand reasons of why we're different, but I can also find our, common, our commonality. And it's yes. my commonality that connects me to people. And when you're the outsider, comedy works because we can laugh at the same things. We don't, we, we, we don't laugh at the same things, all of us. I mean, we cry at the same things, but we don't laugh at the same things. And I try and find what it is that makes us laugh and smile. And then life is much easier. Absolutely. This is such a wonderful thing to say, to hear and to do then thank you so much it's really it was incredible conversation you know i've learned myself so many little intricacies about your life and your life story and thank you very much and to all our listeners uh today uh, was episode number 31 for conversations with olga it's probably my last episode for this year but you never know it might i might just come up with something else just before the new year and you all will know about it but every episode just like tonight's episode with bobby chin will be recorded i will post the link on my social media i'm sure bobby will post it on his social media uh, all the episodes and of course tonight's as well is also available on the youtube channel on the conversation with olga so please follow me 
please follow Bobby Chin and follow his programs and join in his passion. And uh, thank you so much, Bobby, for talking to me and for sharing and for just giving your positivity all around us. I really appreciate it. And I really look forward to see you here very soon. And uh, please stay connected. I, I'd love to, and please throw some more parties because you know we need that. We need. I know. We need classy parties. You're Thank like you. I am class. definitely going to. Yeah. And hopefully one day you will come as my uh, star chef for one of my parties. I would be delighted, Olga. I am at your service, and I really respect all the stuff with that you do. And so Thank it would be my honor and, pro and and privilege and pleasure to do it because I know there will be a lot of friends out there as well. Exactly. Thank you so much. And we all send you big regards from all our hearts. And I'll talk to you very soon. And thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. And Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Uh, and uh, stay well, stay positive, and enjoy the food and follow Bobby. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye.